preferable no good hairy bad way. We are here tonight. <clears throat> Welcome to my life at Let's Go Solutions Journalism. I'm Laura Hunnenthal, Dean of Film School of Communication and Journalism, and Executive Director of the Alamo Center for Communicating Science. So we're happy to see everyone here in person. It's really a pleasure. And I'm particularly delighted to bring to you tonight Tia Rosenberg, who is a co-founder of the Solutions Journalism Network, a New York Times journalist, author of three books, including one that won the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize. That just deserves a round of applause for you. She has an extraordinary performance, but her contribution to journalism and society goes far beyond. And it's for these reasons that I'm particularly honored to have her have you here with us tonight. Tina is leading with her colleagues and close collaborator David Pornstein, a national, actually international effort to expand what journalism can and should do and the role that it can and should play in society. I had the incredible opportunity to be monetary. JD, thanks to you, to spend some time with Tina and David and a whole bunch of amazing people working in solutions journalism out in Utah <clears throat> this past spring at a solutions journalism network event. I learned so much. I was deeply moved and inspired by the work. Um, they are catalyzing and spreading solutions journalism across the globe. It was really a spectacular experience. It's inspired me as the leader of the school to bring solutions journalism to the core of what we are doing in journalism. For those of you who are less familiar with this approach, solutions journalism investigates responses to solutions, to problems, rather than just hunting out the problems themselves. I think that's, as someone who identifies as a solutions-oriented communication researcher, this just struck a chord in my heart. Um, often, we're talking about really big, systemic, sticky, wicked problems, homelessness, poverty rates, aspects of the climate crisis, um, issues around vaccination, public health, inequality, you name it. These are really layered, complex problems that deserve deeper attention, data-driven approaches, and a focus on what have people done to work on things that are seemingly School of Communication and Journalism, we believe that change requires communication that's inclusive, engaged, and deeply respectful. Solutions Journalism is one piece of this puzzle, and it's a piece that I'm proud to say we are integrating across our journalism program at the undergraduate and graduate levels. Our faculty, we have uh, one here tonight, Jamie, where are you? Where are you sitting? Did JD have today? JD is a newly certified solutions journalism instructor. And Terry, you're out there somewhere. Did Terry have to, he had to take off? That's what happens when you work for WSA2. You have to take off. It's soon to be certified, and I hope we will see more of our instructors go through this process. And what they're doing is bringing this work that they're learning. I love seeing lifelong learning of our instructors to classrooms, to their colleagues, to help inspire a generation of journalists who value this approach to solutions journalism. Earlier this year, the school was honored to become one of the first four solutions journalism network hubs in the country. This is a designation we take seriously and we're eager to bring together journalists and media professionals and other journalists and educators from across the Northeast and coordinate with our other health partners across the country to discuss, collaborate on, and spread the mission of solutions journalism. Tonight marks our first public foray into this effort. I'm delighted to see some of our media partners from WSHU and elsewhere, and Sir 
Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Laura, for that introduction. And more importantly, thank you for all you're doing to um, make Stony Brook a hub for solutions journalism. We are incredibly excited about the work you're doing here and hope to be a part of it on an ongoing basis for a long time. Thank you for bringing me out here. Thanks to Laura. Thank you to Lori also, to Nate. Um, to Tim, who's filming this, to the tech folks, Reggie and Joanne, for helping uh, make this uh, go smoothly. And thank you all for coming to this tonight. So, um, I've been a journalist for many decades, but the solutions journalism part of it is relatively recent. Up till about 2000, I did what most journalists do, and that is write stories that uncover problems. I um, didn't study journalism as an undergrad, but I do have a master's in journalism. I studied television, actually, at Medill because I wanted to work in political campaigns and do campaign commercials. I didn't want to be a journalist. Um, I worked in a campaign for about six weeks and changed my mind. <laughs> OK, journalism. And luckily, um, Medill had a network, and people I knew from Medill, when they were too busy to do a project that someone offered them, they threw it over to me. So that's how I got started. Um, and I remained a freelancer until 1997. Um, I was most of the time living in Latin America, first in Nicaragua, and then in Chile, and then later in Mexico City. And I also went to Eastern Europe for a few years. And in those places, I covered exactly what you think I would be covering. Dictatorship, torture, human rights abuses, hunger, illness, poverty. I was covering what I thought the important problems were. And another way of looking at it is I was covering the stereotypes that we in the United States have about those places. And my mission could be construed as saying, I'm going to take those stereotypes you have and show them that they're even truer than you thought they were by my coverage. So um, as Laura pointed out, I was successful. I made a living as a freelancer, which not everyone does. I won some awards. And in 1997, I got hired by the New York Times on the editorial page. And I was still thinking of journalism as most journalists do, which is I will uncover a problem and the way it works, according to journalists, is that someone will then swoop in and solve that problem once we uncover it. How many people are happy with how that works? Raise your hand. <laughs> Not very often, I would say. Um, so, yeah, there we go. That's our, that's our way. That's our way. So um, it didn't, certainly didn't work in Latin America or Eastern Europe, not very often. And by not often, I mean never. Um, but that was OK, because I was still doing my work as a journalist, which was to uncover and illuminate problems. It did not occur to me that I could do anything differently, that I could have a different kind of impact, a real impact, that I could make the world a fairer place, that I could help people truly to understand each other, going beyond stereotypes, and that I could connect with the people who were, who were reading what I wrote and that I could offer up a truly accurate mirror to the world. And then in the year 2000, I did a story, well, I proposed a story to my editor at the New York Times Sunday Magazine about the price of AIDS drugs in poor countries. Antiretrovirals had been invented in 1995, and they were widespread now around the world, but they cost $12,000 to $20,000 a year, and there were no discounts and no generics, and people who lived in the places with the highest AIDS burden could not afford them. It was as if they didn't exist. 
That was widely known, of course. What was not widely known at the time, though, was why. And the reason was, and this is the story I wanted to do, an investigative piece, collusion between the pharmaceutical industry and the government of turn in Washington. At the time, it was Clinton, but Democrat, Republican, it didn't really matter to put political pressure on countries if they made moves towards making or buying generics. If you did that, you landed on a trade watch list, and that would piss off powerful members of your society, and they would put a clamp on it. So I thought this was a pretty important story, and I pitched it to my editor, and he said, no. We can't inflict another 7,000-word story on our readers about how everybody with HIV is going to die in Malawi. Um, not fresh enough, and um, too depressing, and people are tired of that. So I went home, and I rethought the story, and I thought, well, I can turn it inside out. There was one country that was actually making its own generic versions of drugs and giving them out to, for free to all its people who needed it, defying Washington and the pharmaceutical manufacturers in the process, and that was Brazil. So the story became what Brazil was doing to try to solve this problem, what was working and not working, because it wasn't perfect, about Brazil's program. And in the course of telling that story, I said everything I wanted to say about the bad behavior that Brazil had to fend off, um, and how other countries, which were smaller and poorer than Brazil, could not fend off that bad behavior. So um, this was a much better way of telling the story. First, got into the paper. You don't get into the paper, you don't have any other advantages. It was fresh to people. People um, did know that everyone with AIDS was going to die in Malawi. They did not know that people with HIV were living normal lives in Brazil. I didn't write the headline, by the way. I consider that a bit of overclaiming. Um, and it was empowering. It felt empowering to people. A piece on AIDS in the year January of 2001 made people feel empowered and excited. And it had impact. At the time, the UN was talking about setting up the Global Fund for AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. And Big Pharma was arguing, you can't do this because poor countries can't take antiretrovirals right. They will create drug resistance, and that'll make it useless for everybody. And this story showed that was not true. So it helped to push the debate from can poor countries provide antiretrovirals to their people over to how can poor countries do what Brazil is doing. And now they all are doing what Brazil is doing and have been for a while. So since that time, anytime I've done a piece on a uh, story that my editor would dismiss as too depressing, which was 100% of what I wrote, I would ask myself, is there a possible solutions angle? And I did my magazine work along those lines. Then in the year 2010, my, um, Laura referred to him as my colleague. He's actually my work husband. I, I have a real husband and he has a real wife, but we're work, work husband and wife. We started writing the fixes column in the New York Times, which once a week we would, um, write a story about a solution to a social problem. And it ran for 11 years. And then David kept saying, let's not keep this to ourselves. Let's spread this idea around. And um, he, though, he, I've never done anything but journalism. David is an NGO person at heart, and he understood how NGOs work, because he had covered a lot of them. So he decided we were going to start an NGO to spread solutions journalism. And I said, have a great time. And I came back to the fixes column, and he went off to SJN. But it took me, really, a couple months to, to realize that the really important work was over there. So we stopped the fixes column um, after 11 years, 2011, uh, sorry, 2021. And um, uh, I was full time at SJN even before that. But now that's what we both do. And SJN is we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan, non-governmental organization. We are mostly funded by different foundations. And our mission is not only to spread solutions journalism, but to transform 
journalism, to, to help in the transformation of journalism, which has changed hugely in the past 20 years, but almost all that change has stayed in the realms of business model or platform. Very, almost none of it in the area of content. So this is one of the few innovations in the area of content. And, um, and we are working on that. So um, why would anybody listen to us? Journalism is a very defensive profession. Um, we don't tend to take well to people telling us, this is not how you should do your work. We tend to say, I've always done it like this. It's what I've learned. I'm going to keep doing it like this. And um, that's changed, though, because of the twin crises that journalism is going through. First of all, the economic crisis that began with Craigslist in about the year 2000, which took um, classified ads away from newspapers, a big source of income, and has gotten far worse with online advertising. Google and Facebook can target um, <coughs> for advertisers much better than a newspaper can. And as a result, people advertise with Google and Facebook. They don't advertise in newspapers anymore. And as a result, it is now um, better to be a coal miner in America than it is to be a journalist in terms of job security. We have lost more jobs than coal mining has. A quarter of the newspapers in the United States have closed. And most if of those that have remained have, be, have become hollowed out. Um, 40 people before, seven people now. So, um, so the decline actually continues and is accelerating. So journalism is open to new ideas. And one thing that we learned early on was that journalists are as tired of writing about problems as readers are tired of reading about them. We want to do something different. We don't want to be writing the same story over and over again. But journalists were afraid to tackle those kinds of stories because they didn't want it coming out sounding like advocacy or fluff or PR or good news. They needed it to be rigorous journalism. So at SJN, we did not invent solutions journalism. It was, it's been around for a long time. Many people like me stumbled into it accidentally. But what we have done is we put a name to it. We put rules. We put a system for doing it. If you want to know exactly how to write a, a solutions journalism story, here's step one, here's step two, here's step three. And here are the four qualities that make a solutions journalism story. We've defined them very precisely. So it is easy to do this kind of work in a rigorous way. And that is really the value that we offer. Um, so what do people use solutions journalism for? First of all, with a, a couple of small exceptions, nobody does nothing but solutions journalism. It is part of your news report. It's just, we want it to move the balance slightly more over to the side of solutions, but nobody's going to take it all the way there. It's not a tool for breaking news. It is an enterprise story, just like investigative reporting or most features, profile writing, et cetera. Um, we have. We collect solutions journalism stories at SJN. We're not a destination site. We don't do them ourselves. But we collect them in our solution story tracker. We vet them. We uh, summarize them. We tag them. And then we link to the story on their original site. And you can search all different ways for them. This is a fantastic tool. Um, this, is, this is what the body of the tracker looks like. Um, and so here's some examples of the kinds of stories that are in the tracker. And I'll just let you read the headlines on these. Love this one. One in 10 readers of the upside in The Guardian shares a story online in social media, which is pretty high. This was the first solutions journalism story we ever helped with. The Seattle Times established Education Lab in uh, 2013. So what happened and could it be replicated elsewhere? Absolutely key sentences. Mm -hmm. 
So, um, okay. All over the world, people are doing this. All sorts of platforms, um, audio, video, social media, people are doing Instagram stories using solutions journalism. Um, so what do, what do these stories have in, in common? Um, not much aside from the fact that they cover responses to a problem. A solutions journalism story can be very big or very small. My story about Israel was very big because it's a problem that is usually addressed at the national level. And a story about something that's addressed at the neighborhood level very small. It can be about a neighborhood program. It depends on the scope of the program. Um, it can be used to cover any problem that's widely shared. Because if a problem is widely shared, then lots of people have tried to solve it. And some of those solutions are going to be more interesting and newsworthy and successful than others and worth writing about. Um, can you use it to cover a war? People would ask us, well, how do you cover the war in the Ukraine with solutions journalism? Nah, you can't. It's really, it's not a breaking news tool. You're not going to cover, here's what happened today. But if there's a hospital in Ukraine that has managed to keep its doors open and treating patients, although the electricity is gone and they're being bombed, that's a solutions journalism story. It's a, it's a feature story, and, but it can be applied to situations where there is constant breaking news. Um, can you use it to cover a political campaign? Well, no, not in the sense of, Here's what this candidate said today, or the polls. But you can do it by treating um, politics as a field, just like health or like criminal justice. You can talk about, for example, what Alaska did to have nonpartisan primaries, or how Iowa has depoliticized its uh, state legislature. I'm making these up. Um, you know, if you treat politics like that, you can look at who is doing better to solve some of the problems that are afflicting our political system. And you cannot cover a solution, you can't cover a political campaign from a solutions angle, but you can use it. For example, the candidate for mayor says he favors this program. Well, over there they're doing this program. Let's go look and see how well it's doing. And you give people a more realistic look at what campaign promises are. So um, when we started, we thought we would get an awful lot of pushback from After all, um, this is very contrary to what people think of as their jobs. And people might be thinking, it's not my job to burnish somebody's reputation or say nice things about people. They have PR firms for that. And I understand that. But in truth, if we can spend five minutes explaining it, then the people who started out like this are then like this. And they're interested, and they get it. The problem we thought we'd come up against was attitude change. We haven't come up against attitude change. What we have come up against is behavior change, which is a lot more difficult. Um, there's many, many people who go to a solutions journalism workshop who are interested in doing their story, who are planning it out and ready to go, but I can't work on it today because I have to do three stories for the paper today. So I'll, I'll start it on it tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes. The very same shortage of resources that has opened journalism to new ideas makes it pretty difficult for anybody to try them out, um, especially because you have systems in newsrooms that are still the old way of systems. You have the board up that shows you how many clicks you got on your story that you did today. You come into a staff meeting in the morning, and the editor stands there and says, what have you got for me today? And of course, the, the, pers the person on general assignment is like, uh, well, I'm going to go to this press conference. Great. That is not an attitude that's, con that's conducive to doing solutions journalism. And in my opinion, that's going to kill your newspaper. The newsrooms that survive are going to be ones that have put aside incremental stories and low value stories and dedicate their dwindling resources to only the highest value work. Enterprise stories, investigations, feature stories, profiles, yes, solution stories. The hard part isn't deciding to do a solution story. The hard part is stopping what you're doing to be able to do a solution story. And the same is true with every kind of enterprise reporting. If you're not offering the highest value to your readers, no one is going to pay for it. 
There's too many other places online that can get crappy free news. What you have to offer, if you're going to charge for it, is not crappy news. So um, let's talk about why it's important to do solutions journalism. Let me start with this. Who here remembers this in 2014, the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, in Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia? Okay? Even if you're not raising your hand, I know that you heard about this, right? Billions of people across the world. Who knew about this? In the countries around those three countries where the epicenter was, they had single or double digit cases of Ebola and, and it took care of them. Anybody know about that? Who knows about this? One. Who knows about this? One, two, three, yay. Why don't we know about those other things? I'm not saying that you're going to splash them on your cover like this. Um, I know we have some Bloomberg and Business Week fans here. <laughs> um, but damn, we should be reporting on it, right? I mean, those are important things for society to know. But that's not our job, right? Not our job. So that's one reason we should do solutions journalism, is it's just a more accurate picture of society, which is what we're supposed to be doing as journalists, hold an accurate mirror up to society so society can change. The mirror is distorted if all we are doing is talking about the problems and not about the solutions. The second things, thing that, that, second reason it's important to do solutions journalism is that um, it gives you more real world impact. Far from being soft news, it's the hardest kind of news you can do. Brie Zeltner and her colleague Rachel Dissel did, worked with us on a series at the Cleveland Plain Dealer back when that was actually a real newspaper about <laughs> lead paint and the Cleveland's problem of lead paint on the walls. And the, the paper had done a couple of stories about lead paint in Cleveland and nothing happened. This time what they did was not just report on what Cleveland was doing wrong, but I don't know if you remember that story about Rochester before, Rochester and his lead paint problem. Rochester across Lake Erie was, had, had done a lot of things right. So let's, let's look at that. Um, the way that that helps accountability reporting, which is the highest form of reporting we all worship on that altar, is it takes a problem that city officials could have dismissed as unavoidable. Oh, it's a terrible problem, but we're doing the best we can, and makes it unacceptable. You're not doing the best you can, because over there they're doing better, and they don't have any more resources than we do. So impact, that's number two. Number three is um, audiences want it. And I've talked to a lot of people even this evening who have said that they have noticed that their audiences want this. News avoidance, big problem. We, all, we think it's for politics, but you know it isn't for politics because you all feel the same thing. You don't want to watch the news or read the news or listen to the news because it makes you want to go back to bed and pull the covers over your head, right? We even, are, even us journalists, we feel that. By far the biggest reason people avoid the news is that it's too negative and makes you feel disempowered. So even a little bit of solutions reporting helps to um, help to overcome that. There is a common misconception that um, solutions journalism does not sell, that people don't want it. They only want to know about bad things. That's a bit of a confusion. Um, it's true that, for example, in in, when you're covering political, I won't even dignify them by calling them debates, people love to hear about the stupid things the opposing side said. That is true, but that's a different kind of news. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about more serious investigative reporting here. Um, and in addition, clickbait and what people click on is not what is going to keep your newsroom 
alive and the lights open anymore. It used to be when we had advertising as our business model. Advertising is a business model that sells a portion of the reader's interest to a company. What we have now with the death of advertising, and it's not coming back, is a business model that for the first time aligns with good journalism. It's because it, what it does is it sells good journalism to people, to readers. Your new business model is memberships, subscriptions, philanthropic donations, and those things come because you do great and interesting and unique stories. Clickbait is no longer a thing. So um, that's the fourth reason. It can help you, so solutions journalism can help you earn revenue. News organizations that track what people have been looking at when they go to subscribe, they find solutions journalism is one of their top things. That's what makes people say, I'm going to subscribe to this newspaper. And that's the holy grail now, not clickbait. Most important, the most important reason is we are, as journalists, a negative force in society. The most toxic bias in journalism is not a left-wing or right-wing bias. It's our bias towards the negative. And the reason it's so toxic it is that it is not committed by bad journalists alone. It is committed by good journalists. We don't realize we have this bias. It's so permeated how we think, but it gives a really misleading and toxic impression to society. It has made trust plummet in the United States. If you ask people the question, do you feel that most people are basically good? The, the number of people who answer that question, yes, has gone straight down since the mid-70s. Um, we especially don't trust people who don't look like us because the main reason we know about those folks is through the media, which is why it's called media, by the way, because it medi mediates our relationship with the world. And the media doesn't give us a true picture of those people. Um, it creates um, a stereotype of those people. With political views, the media always search, not always, but usually our, our main modus operandi has been to search out the most inflammatory quotes we can find on both sides and represent them in our story as balance. And that gives you the very wrong impression. It's actually not true that, that most people agree with the extremes. The vast majority of people do not. But that's not what we, what we know when we're reading it because we see the two extremes and it's represented as if this was normal. It makes us even more polarized than we actually are. That works out some way, but it's, it's a false polarization that leads to even more polarization. And then it's also a racial injustice that underlines every other kind of racial injustice. One of the papers that we've worked with most closely is the Montgomery Advertiser in Alabama. And they have just, they did this recently. Front page editorial, these are the names of people who have been lynched. Apologizing for the paper's role in the shameful history of lynchings in the past. Why is that doing that? Um, when I went to Montgomery for the first time, I asked people there who worked in the paper, what do you guys think of mainstream media coverage of Alabama? Like the New York Times and CNN and Washington Post. <laughs> we hate it, it's awful. Well, why? Because you make us look like ignorant yahoos. And I said, are those stories inaccurate? Probably could have phrased that better. And they said, mm, they're not inaccurate. They're accurate, but it's partial. I mean, you, you, we do a lot of things that make us look like ignorant yahoos, but we also do a lot of things that don't, and you're not interested in those things. You don't report on them, and it gives a really misleading picture of the South to the North, and we feel angry about it, and we feel that you look down on us, and we feel scorned, and we frankly hate you because of this. So I totally agree with that statement. But at the same time, 
But the reporters at the Advertiser were able to identify with the victim's point of view on the north-south divide, they were unable to spot that they were the perpetrators in their own city divide. They were still doing this. Montgomery is a largely black city. There is a tremendous amount of black business activity, community organizations, non-governmental institutions, initiatives to solve problems in the black community. That's advancing by itself. And the paper didn't cover that. They covered shootings. That's what they covered. They were doing the same thing to black Montgomery that the New York Times was doing to Alabama. And, and we all do that. When you Google these cities, Englewood, neighborhood of Chicago, Brownsville, neighborhood of Brooklyn, here's what you get. Shooting, stabbing, car theft, armed robbery, shooting, shooting, damn. Uh, I don't, crime, assault, attack with hammer, uh, injured policemen. Oh, there's an affordable de housing development. Well, that's, un that's unusual. That is not what you normally see from these places. You see shootings, and that's all you see. And that is a racial injustice, and it creates a stereotype and reinforces a stereotype about people we don't know that make all other racial injustices stronger. It is really, really bad for society. So we worked with the, with the advertiser to help them take a different view and do more solution stories about what Black Montgomery was doing. Oh, this thing. Yeah, don't just do solution stories where somebody comes in from the outside to solve a community's problems. So Bro, the editor, who's now the editor of the Indiana Star, Indianapolis Star, um, wrote an editorial about the change in the paper. And they did stories like this. This is a guy who reversed brought blight in his community by buying houses that were empty, and the, and the yards were empty and were blighted. He bought them up cheap, and the church refurbished them, and then they sold them. Win, win, win for everybody. So that is now a large part of the report that the, the Montgomery Advertiser does. So I am going to stop here, but I'm first going to say thank you to Laura, to Stony Brook for adopting us, Solutions Journalism Network, for becoming a hub. To the students that are here, thank you for coming. I'm really thrilled that you'll have the opportunity to learn from these wonderful professors about solutions journalism. It'll give you a better chance to make a difference with your journalism career. And let's face it, we're not in this for the money. Um, we're in this because we want to make a difference, right? And it'll give you, perhaps just as important, more of an opportunity to enjoy your job. So I'm hoping that at some point much later, you can all look back on your lives as solutions journalists. Thank you. Tons of time, comments, questions. And speak out in the booming voice that this, that this man has. Right, oh, that's better. Do you want to pass the mic around, or do people need to oh, go up come here? On. Somebody ask a question. I got one. No, no, okay. I don't think I need a mic. Well, but somebody's recording this, okay. so you kind of do. Yeah. Hi, I'm the Dial General Manager, WFHU Public Radio. Thank you, Tina. Thank you. So we know lies travel faster than truth. How how can we better use then solutions journalism? to combat misinformation and disinformation? Clearly, that's a really easy question for me to ask, right? <laughs> Thank you. There's one school of thought that says you can't combat misinformation. All you, you can just put out real information, and that journalists should not make it their job to try to combat misinformation. I don't agree with that. Um, I agree with the, with the old saying that conspiracy is the refuge of the powerless. 
People go to conspiracy theories when they don't feel that um, they're being respected or heard in other ways. So if mainstream journalism does more to make underserved communities, and I'm not just talking about people on the west side of Montgomery, Alabama, I'm talking about you know, rural red state folks, um, anyone who feels themselves to be a marginalized community, which is a lot of people, if people don't have this anger, if they feel heard and respected, if they feel like the coverage of their own community is fair, maybe they will not resort to conspiracy theories and disinformation as much. I obviously have no proof of that in any way. But to me, it seems like respect, people need to, to feel respected and reflected in what they read about themselves or the mainstream media never has a chance with them. Hi, my name is Rob Proto. I'm part of the Stony Brook Communications team. Um, some of the things you just mentioned about Alabama, I've experienced in conversations here on Long Island, which are very different demographic. So my question is, um, in getting solutions journalism out to an audience, you run into a wall that is tough to reach the very people that would benefit most from hearing what you have to say. You mean because they're just not reading your newspaper? Um, sometimes not reading it, and sometimes because you're seeking to prove a narrative that they very much want to believe in, and you get into the same thing where you provide credible proof after more credible proof, and they just absolutely won't budge. Well, that's because this is not about the brain. It's about the heart, right? I mean, it's quite obvious that credible proof doesn't sway people. We've tried that. We keep trying it. Um, as, as my colleague David says, I don't care what you know until I know that you care. And um, the messenger is really important. So if people think that they're being looked down on by the media, they're not going to be open to what the media has to say. Um, how to get them to read you in the first place is a different question, and I'm not quite sure how to solve that, other than sort of do a lot of social media and meet people where they are. But um, yeah, that's my answer. Do you keep track of pays for the solutions? How much did it cost? Who paid for the research to develop in terms of distributed free in Brazil? Who paid for distributing it? Who paid for all these solutions? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch it. Who paid for the research on what in Brazil? Uh, the free drugs that were distributed. These examples again. They distributed free drugs for uh, HIV and AIDS, I think it was. I see. If I'm understanding you correctly, they, they have a health to yeah. Oh, I see. Not who paid for the research, but who paid for the drugs. Okay. Um, well, Brazil decided it was much cheaper for antiretrovirals, especially because they were making them for literally one you know, 3% of the price of the, of the brand name version. And it was much cheaper to give people those than to hospitalize them with um, opportunistic infections afterwards. So this was a no-brainer for Brazil in terms of money. But in terms of the research, they have a health department. They collect statistics. The uh, PAHO, the uh, organization, the Pan American Health Organization collects statistics. And then now there's AIDS organizations. UN AIDS collects statistics everywhere. So um, it's possible that Brazil's fudging its statistics. Is, is, that, what, is that your point? Don't worry about the Brazil example. The question is, if you're publishing solutions to problems, who's paying for the solutions? Where does that money come from? Forget about the Right, OK, thank you. 
Um, well, it depends on what the solution is. But in many cases, the solution's a lot cheaper than to let the problem go on. It's much cheaper to house someone who's unhoused than to pay for their constant you know, emergency room trips and, 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 and jailings afterwards. Um, but it, the same people who would be paying to not have the solution, to pay, continue the status quo, would be the people who would be paying for the solution. I'm sorry if I misunderstood you. Hi, uh, Christine Kelly. Um, I guess my question was, um, uh, I suppose in terms of solutions journalism, is this new or is it a new name uh, for like for something we've been doing for a while? Like, because um, because I I read a lot of old journalism. I appreciate the uh, plain dealer call back there because I've been reading a lot of. Uh, 100 year old issues back to genealogy research, but for what I found, like you do, like have this long tradition of reporters you know, talking about solutions to problems. Like um, my great grandfather, who was a uh, locomotive engineer for Kennecott, Utah Copper in Salt Lake Valley, um, I just found, I remember finding, say, stories about um, him negotiating the union deals. So that seemed that as an um, early example. Of that kind of, you're just like, here's where people are stepping in to solve a problem. So, is that something new? Or what particularly makes some solutions journalism uh, as a concept stand out? It's not new. You're right. People have been doing it. Prominent people. Has anybody read Moneyball? You know, if Michael Lewis wanted to write a book about the corrosive influence of money in baseball, he could have followed a loser of a team that was broke all the time, but nobody would have read that one. Instead, he followed the positive deviant, the people who, on very little money, did very well. Almost everything Michael Lewis does is a solutions book, although he probably has no idea about that. I mean, most people who do so, Joe, don't even know they're doing it. What we are doing is simply making it easier to spread and teach by giving it a name and some rules and a system. We did not invent it. Can you pass that to your neighbor? Thanks. I had a question about, uh, I remember in 116 we talked about asset framing kind of being part of solutions journalism. So, like a lot of the time, especially if you're talking about something like the opioid crisis, you'll read this community is ravaged, right? And, you know, it'll be kind of like a, almost like a disaster pornography kind of exhibition of suffering. And, and that'll be kind of the, you know, that'll kind of be the thrust of the whole thing. But uh, when, when it comes to asset framing, I was wondering, um, isn't there kind of like a, a moral judgment that comes in there? And, and I think so. Um, can you give me another example, Dima, of what kind of asset framing you're talking about? asset framing is. He's talking about something that isn't the same as solutions journalism, although it's related. It's basically saying the first impressions are so important to your brain that it's very hard to change your mind after the first impression. And therefore, we should start with first impressions. The first time you meet a character, they should be introduced through their aspirations and assets, not through their deficits. So. I don't know, is it taking sides? We're not asking people to make stuff up, um, but like, if you are talking about um, you know, uh, a, a, a kid who's, who's been arrested for a crime, you could introduce them as an at-risk youth, which is not asset framing, it's just ridiculous language, or you could say something else about you know, a drug pusher or something like that, but you could also call him a student, because he's a student. And then in the second paragraph, you can get to what he did. 
So um, it's, it's just a way of organizing your lead so that you aren't starting with the worst thing. Um, we don't teach that much, um, and it's hard for people to understand, so I appreciate your question. There's someone behind you. Great question, thank you. Just by remembering that we have it is step one. I mean, people say, um, of course we have a bias towards the negative. You know, we don't report on the plane that lands safely, right? We do report on the one that crashes, because that's the unusual part. But sometimes if, if, if everybody's expecting a steady diet of dysfunction and failure and corruption, then something that works is the unusual part. And that can be a story too. And you know, no one's asking you to, to report on the plane that lands safely. But if there is an airline that used to have a cruddy safety record and has greatly improved it, then it's an interesting story, a solution story about how they did that. So I mean, I think the key really is, is just to remember that news is not necessarily defined as what's bad that to give an accurate picture of society, it has to be broader than that. That, to me, is the most important step to take. And it turns a little switch on your brain, and you can no longer see it the old way. What's the last sentence you said, sorry? How can they benefit reaching across new engagement in their communities and uh, reinvigorate global journalism? These stories are in some ways depoliticizing. Um, because instead of sort of, you know, you, you can do a story about bad learning, and, you know, test scores went down, and what you get is an argument in the community about who's at fault. Is it the teachers' union, charter schools? But if you do a story about a school that did better, then you have a different kind of discussion. It's much more forward-facing. It's much more constructive. It's not about who's to blame. It's about, can that solution work for us? Can we do that? It's the difference between asking somebody, you know, if you ask somebody, can a handicapped person drive a car, and then you get, a dis you get an argument about, about rights. But if you say, how can a handicapped person drive a car? Then you get a discussion about where to put the brake pedal. It's a, it's, it engages the engineering part of your brain. So in a, in a sense, these do reach across aisles. And there has been um, research done by uh, Smith Geiger, which is a television consulting company, very, very uh, well known and reputable, that shows that solution stories are um, preferred to problem focused stories. Um, they're seen as more interesting, deeper, meatier. They provide, they, they create more loyalty to the station. And this is true regardless of the, the viewer's age, political persuasion, or where they live. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm having trouble understanding you. Does anybody, did anybody hear him clearly? Right, okay. Is, is, Laura thinks you said, how can solutions play a role in media coverage of health issues? And also, uh, it was a health and readership, for example, uh, as, as you mentioned, like anxiety. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Right. That's a good question. And health is one of the best fields for using solutions journalism because there's so much data. And so when you have data, then you can use a method for finding solutions journalism stories called the positive deviant method, where you say, let's talk about childhood asthma, or let's talk about um, you know, sick days that students take because of mental health, or whatever thing you're talking about. There's data on how different places are doing comparatively. And you can find a place that's doing better than the rest, or doing better than, much better than it used to, even if it's not at the top yet. Um, and that might be a story. If, if it's doing better than the rest because it's richer, then that doesn't count. You're cheating. But if it's doing better than the rest and it doesn't have more resources than the rest, then you can do a solution story to look at what did they do? How did they achieve these low rates of childhood asthma? So health is, is very, lends itself a lot to writing solutions journalism stories. And um, yeah, I think the other part of the question we've talked about. Thank you. All right, Sanders, you get the last question, sir. Thank you very much for your presentation. I think this is extremely interesting to our students. However, I think you missed something, but it's fun. It's fun. That's true. Um, after I was fired the second time from CBS, I was working <laughs> for uh, a startup in the United Nations, and we eventually lost our shirts, most people. The startups, but we could do what we want. And Charlene Muntergold, who was an old comrade of mine, had written a book called Good News Out of Africa. And she kind of she challenged me. She said, you're going to be in that big building with all those nasty and you're going to want to cover clubs and dictators and get in people's faces. Why don't you do some good news? So I started looking in the agencies for good news stories. And oh my God, I found a wonderful one. In uh, Rwanda, they were, cha they were training giant African rats. So on animals to sniff out landmines. And they were so light that if they went on the landmine, they did not get blown up like dogs. And the kids around there had made up a song about the hero rats. And they all went around singing hero rats. And that was just so much fun to do as a story. But there's another kind of solutions journalism. You look at a problem and you say, problem, problem. In the early 1980s, you may remember that there was this giant campaign in America against the evil empire to free all Soviet Jews. We've got to get all the Jews out of Russia. Who would have no advisors now, but that's another story. Mike Wallace and I decided to do a solutions journalism kind of story. We went and we found a whole bunch of Jews who were making lots of money, were very happy, had nice apartments, didn't want to leave, didn't even want to leave Moscow. And the best part about it was when we did the story, we pissed off so many people in America that <laughs> 60 Minutes never got as many letters as they got for that story. <laughs> That's fun. Don't forget to put the journalists have to have fun in what they're doing. Add fun to your list. I don't know what the question is. <laughs> what a great note to end on. Thank you. <laughs>